Electricity is the flow of charge or charges, like electrons, they have charge. They carry energy from a source of energy, like a battery that has a store of chemical potential energy, to a component, like a bulb, where the energy is released as another type of energy, light in this case. Here's the diagram for this simple circuit, including the symbols that we use. And we draw straight lines for the wires that the electrons flow through in order for this charge to flow. By the way, you're going to see me mix up cells and batteries because they're just the same thing really and they do the same job. It's not that important guys. The movement of this charge is called a current and we say this current goes from the positive terminal of the battery to the negative. And you might realize that seems the wrong way round, but don't think about it too much. It's not important for GCSE. Current goes from positive to negative. So the electrons go from the battery to the lamp where their energy is converted into light and maybe a bit of heat too. And this then is transferred to the surroundings. As this is one big loop, these electrons are pushed back round to the battery by the ones behind them where they're re-energized ready for another trip to the lamp. This constant flow of electrons transferring energy is what keeps the light bulb on. Because electrons are so small and there are so darn many of them, we don't deal with individual electrons, but instead we deal with coulombs of charge or coulombs of electrons, similar to moles in chemistry. But in this case, we don't care what the number is, we just say we're grouping them into coulombs. Potential difference, PD for short, also known as voltage, tells us how much energy is transferred per coulomb of these electrons or coulomb of charge. So if you have a one volt cell or battery, that just means that one joule of energy is given to every coulomb of charge, every coulomb of electrons that pass through it. If a battery is six volts, that just means that six joules is supplied per coulomb instead. We measure PD with a voltmeter. Voltmeters always get added last to a circuit, as they're always connected in parallel to the components you want to measure the PD for. In the real world, that means the wires or leads or cables from the voltmeter always piggyback into the leads going into the component. If you put the voltmeter across the battery, it should measure 6 volts. That's because 6 volts worth of energy is supplied to the electrons as they pass through the battery. That just means that 6 joules of energy is supplied to each coulomb. But put the voltmeter across the bulb and it will still say 6 volts. Why? Because the electrons have to lose all of that 6 volts worth of energy as they pass through. Okay, you might say it's minus 6 volts instead, but we don't really care about minuses when it comes to PD. We just care about the number. Here's the equation for PD or voltage. PD in volts is equal to energy in joules divided by charge in coulombs. V is equal to E over or divided by Q. Q is the symbol for charge, but it's measured in coulombs, C. You'll probably see the rearranged version, E equals QV, on your formula sheet. Current, on the other hand, tells us what the rate of flow of charge is. Essentially, how fast charge is flowing through the circuit or a component. Like any equation for a rate, it's something divided by time. So here, current in amps equals charge in coulombs divided by time in seconds, or I equals Q over T. Yes, we use capital I as the symbol for current, not C. Blame the French for that, as they called current intensité du courant. Again, you're probably going to see the rearranged version of this equation on your formula sheet. Q equals IT. That's I times T, current multiplied by time. We measure current with an ammeter. Note that's not an amp meter. Unlike a voltmeter, an ammeter must go in series, which means in line with the component we want to measure the current flowing through. Components in a circuit have resistance, that is, they resist the flow of charge or current through them. But that's not a bad thing. This has to happen in order for them to work. For example, a bulb has resistance, which causes energy to be transferred and light to be emitted. A resistor, of course, has resistance too, but it just produces heat when current flows through it. So a resistor is basically a little heater. If we make a circuit with a resistor and change the PD available to it, what we find is that an increasing PD results in a greater current flowing. In fact, doubling one doubles the other, so we can say that PD and current, or V and I, are directly proportional. Drawing a graph of these two makes a straight line. And if we turn the battery round, we can get negative values for both two, but still a straight line through the origin. This straight line has a constant gradient, and that shows that the resistor has constant resistance. We say it's ohmic. The steeper the gradient of this line, the lower the resistance of the resistor, as more current is flowing at any voltage. The equation for resistance is Ohm's law. V equals IR. That's PD in volts equals current in amps times resistance in ohms. That's the unit for resistance. That horseshoe symbol is the Greek letter omega. That's what we use. We can get resistance of a component from an IV graph like this by just picking a point on the line, getting V and I, and putting them into the rearranged version of Ohm's law. R is equal to V over I. 
For a resistor, you'll end up with the same answer no matter what point you pick. If you repeat the same experiment for a bulb, however, that's a filament lamp that has a piece of metal in, in place of the resistor, you'll end up with a curved graph like this. This shows that the resistance is changing, the resistance of the metal filament in the bulb. In fact, you'll find this is true for any metal. If you increase the PD, that does increase the current, but it's non-ohmic in this case. Can you see, at higher PDs, the current increases less and less, so that means they can't be proportional. This shows that the resistance of the metal is increasing with a higher PD and current. The change in gradient shows us that the resistance has changed, but we still just take a point on the line and use Ohm's law if we want to find the resistance. We never draw a tangent on one of these graphs. That would tell us nothing. So, why does resistance change for a metal? Well, it's because metals consist of a lattice or grid of ions surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. That just means the electrons are free, and they're free to move, or rather, they're fairly free to move, because they do collide with the ions as they flow. That's why the metal will heat up if you pass a current through it. The higher the current, the more frequent these collisions are. This makes the ions vibrate more and more, which in turn makes it harder for the electrons to flow. Now, as an aside, certain exam boards have royally messed up in their exams over the past couple of years because they've asked the question, what would happen to a resistor if the temperature increased, to which the mark scheme says that its resistance would increase. They are wrong. Resistors are specifically made from special materials such that their resistance stays constant, even if the temperature changes when a higher current flows through it. If that wasn't the case, we wouldn't get this straight line for the graph, and we might as well just use a metal instead. Now, there is another component called a diode. It will give you this graph. Its symbol might give you a clue as to what it does. A diode only lets current flow in one direction. We say that in one direction, the resistance is very high, and it's very low in the other, which is why the current increases suddenly at around one volt. An LED is a light-emitting diode, similar symbol, just with a circle and arrows added. These are what most light and electronics are these days, rather than filament lamps. We can do another practical on resistance by measuring V and I for a length of metal wire connected to a circuit with crocodile clips to calculate its resistance using Ohm's law. We move one clip further up the wire to see how the length of the wire affects its resistance. Plotting resistance against length, we should end up with a straight line through the origin, showing that they're directly proportional. Here's a simple series circuit. Two resistors in line with the battery. What you need to remember is that for components in series, total PD is shared between them, current is the same for all of them, and the total resistance is just the sum of all resistances. That just means added up. Let's deal with that first point. If these resistors are the same, let's say 10 ohms each, then that 6 volts total PD from the battery must be shared between them. So if we put a voltmeter across each of these, they'd both read 3 volts. It wouldn't matter what resistances these resistors are, they could be a million ohms each. But if they're the same, then that total PD is shared equally. By the time the electrons leave the second resistor, they have to have lost all 6 volts worth of energy, ready to go back to the battery to be re-energized. By the way, we can also call this setup a potential divider circuit, as the total potential, total PD, is being shared. If the resistors don't have the same resistance, then we can use the second point to help us. That is, the current is the same for both. Let's say the first resistor is 20 ohms, and it uses 4 volts of the total 6 volts available. We know two things from V, I, and R, so let's use Ohm's law to calculate the third. In this case, that's the current. Rearranging Ohm's law, we get I is equal to V over R, so that's 4 divided by 20, 0.2 amps. And that's going to be the same for the second resistor too. Is there also a second thing we know about the other resistor? Why, yes, there is. Remembering the first rule, we know that if the first resistor is using 4 volts of the total 6 volts, well, the other resistor must be using up the remaining 2 volts. We then use Ohm's law again to find its resistance, which is 10 ohms. The rule of thumb for series circuits is this. The greater resistance gets the greater share of the total PD. We can also use Ohm's law for a whole circuit. We just need to make sure that we're dealing with the total PD, total current, and total resistance. The rules for parallel circuits are the opposite. The PD is the same for every branch, current is shared between each branch, and the more resistors you add in parallel, the lower the total resistance. This is, by the way, because you're giving the current more routes to move through the circuit, which means it can flow more easily. So, if these two resistors are connected to the 6 volt battery in parallel, you know straight away that the PD for both has to be 6 volts. Voltage isn't split in parallel circuits. However, if we say 0.5 amps total current is flowing through the battery, and 0.2 amps of that is flowing through the top resistor, that must mean that there's 0.3 amps flowing through the bottom resistor. 
If you're not in a rush, why not pause the video and see if you can calculate these two resistances? By the way, if you want a little bit more help on this, have a look at my video, How to Answer Any Electricity Question. It's not only metals that can change resistance. If we use a thermistor, we can make a circuit that responds to changes in temperature. A thermistor's resistance decreases if the temperature increases, so in essence, it does the opposite to a metal. If a thermistor is in a potential divider circuit like here, and the temperature increased, the resistance of the thermistor would go down, and so as does its share of the total PD. That means the voltmeter reading here would increase. This could be the basis of a temperature sensor for your central heating, say. An LDR is a light-dependent resistor, very similar to a thermistor, but resistance goes down with increased light intensity this time, not temperature. So this circuit could be what's in the sensor on the top of a street lamp, for example. Light intensity goes down at night, resistance of the LDR goes up, as does its share of the PD. This then could be used to trigger the street lamp to turn on. We know from the energy topic that power is the rate of energy transferred, so that's energy divided by time. However, when it comes to electricity, we can also calculate it with P equals VI. Power equals voltage, PD, times current. Moreover, if we substitute Ohm's law into this, we swap out the V for IR, and we end up with the alternative equation P equals I times I times R, or P equals I squared R. The electricity that comes out of a battery is DC, or direct current. That's current that only flows in one direction. However, the exam boards these days have an obsession with calling it direct PD, which is a bit pointless because it just results in the same thing. Direct PD is a potential difference that acts in one direction, and this results in direct current. Mains electricity that comes out of your sockets is AC, alternating current, resulting from an alternating PD. In the main circuits in your home, the neutral wire stays at a potential of zero volts, much like the wire connected to the negative terminal of a battery. While the live wire, well, its potential varies from positive to negative, but it averages out to an equivalent of 230 volts, so we say this is mains voltage. This alternating PD causes current to go back and forth at a frequency of 50 Hz. If you hooked up a battery and mains electricity to an oscilloscope, we'd see these two traces to see how the PD changes over time for both of them. Well, it doesn't change in the case of DC, of course. In a plug, the wire with blue insulation is the neutral wire, while brown is the live wire. The third, yellow and green wire, is the earth wire. That's connected to the pin at the top. It's not necessary to complete the circuit, it's a safety wire that's connected to the outside of metal appliances, like kettles or toasters. So if anything goes wrong with the other wires inside the appliance, current will flow through the earth wire to the ground instead of through a person touching it, which would give them an electric shock. Also in a plug, we have a fuse that's attached to the live wire, and it's designed to melt or blow if the current exceeds a certain number of amps, usually 3, 5 or 13 amps. If something goes wrong in an appliance, the current may well spike, so the fuse will blow before too much damage can be done to it or the user. You might need to use P equals VI to calculate the normal operating current for an appliance to deduce what fuse should be used in the plug. Let's say a microwave draws 800 watts of power from the mains. What fuse would it need? We know PD or voltage is 230 volts because it's mains, so we rearrange P equals VI to get the current. So I is equal to P over V, that's 800 divided by 230, that gives us 3.5 amps. We can't use a 3 amp fuse, otherwise it would just blow under normal operation. So we go for the next one up, a 5 amp fuse. A 13 amp fuse would work as well, but the current would have to increase to that before it blows, and that could be dangerous. Electricity is supplied to homes and businesses by the National Grid, a network of power stations, cables and more that transmit it across the country. The current produced by a power station is so huge that if it went straight into the overhead cables you see above you when you're out and about, a huge amount of energy would be lost as heat due to the resistance of the cables. To reduce the energy lost, transformers are used. A step-up transformer outside the power station increases the transmission voltage to over 100,000 volts. As P equals VI and power stays roughly the same in the process, if PD goes up, current must go down. This decrease in current means less energy and power is lost due to heating. Of course, having such a high voltage going into homes would be dangerous and unnecessary, so we have a step-down transformer nearby to reduce it back down to a safer 230 volts. If insulating materials, that is materials that aren't good conductors of electricity, are rubbed against each other, electrons are transferred from one to the other. As electrons are negatively charged themselves, the object electrons are removed from is left positively charged, and the object they're moved to is now negatively charged. Oppositely charged objects attract each other. 
positive and negative. If they have like charge, that means the same charge, both positive or negative, they repel each other instead. If you touch a Van de Graaff generator, electrons are taken from every part of your body, including your hair, leaving all of you positively charged. Your positive head repels your positive hairs, and the hairs also repel each other too. Now, if you see a question that says a Van de Graaff generator makes you negatively charged, that's not really true, but it doesn't really matter. You'd still end up with the same result because every part of you would have the same charge. A charged object produces an electric field. And if you have two objects that have different charges, an electric field is produced between them. We can't see this electric field, of course, but we can represent it with lines. The arrows on the line show the direction of the field, and they always go away from positively charged objects and towards negatively charged ones. If we put a negative charge, say an electron, in a field, it will move in the opposite direction to the field lines, which makes sense because it will be attracted to the positive object. The field between two parallel charged plates like we have here is called a uniform field because all of the field lines are parallel. This shows that the strength of the field is the same everywhere between the two plates. The electric field around one object, say our Van de Graaff here, is radial instead. The field lines are diverging, getting further apart the further you go from the ball. So I hope you found that helpful. Leave a like and a comment if you did. And click on the card to take you to the playlist for all of the papers. And don't forget to check out the Science Shorts app to help you test your knowledge.